I'm going to introduce the session, which is focused on cost of transport and a debate centered around the whether this is the correct metric for mobile systems. And this will uh, feature. So I'm I'm Aaron Young. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm a professor, um, assistant professor in mechanical engineering at, at Georgia Tech. I run the Epic Lab, um, and I'll be the moderator for this session. So there'll be some specific questions that, that we'll be asking all the panelists uh, at the start to kind of get positions and uh, allow for some of the debate to happen. And I'll also be monitoring the, the chat. And so uh, a little bit of a um, background there, uh, we are gonna take some audience questions or, or we hope that you guys will provide some questions for us to give to the panelists. Please do that through the, the Q&A feature. Don't do it through the event chat. So if you see the Q&A, that's where we'll be monitoring for questions. Please put questions in throughout. We'll be asking those later on. And if you really like questions, please upvote them as we'll, we'll kind of do it in the ordering of, of how popular some of the questions are. Uh, hopefully we'll get to all of them, but it depends. It depends. All right. And so for the, our other panelists' introductions, so you've already seen Ani Mazumdar, he's also from Georgia Tech in, in ME. Um, and then next is Greg Sawicki, uh, another one of the Georgia Tech professors, runs the Power Lab at, here at, at Georgia Tech. Um, and then Ye Zhao, uh, who's a newer professor with us, uh, joined what, a year and a half ago um, uh, in ME. And lastly, we've got a guest panelists from University of Michigan. So Elliot Rouse, who I think many of you know, um, and, and runs the neurobionics lab there, is also joining us for today's talk on cost of transport. Okay, so let's let's start. I'm gonna provide just a brief background to just kind of get, get the idea started here. So um, energetic cost in humans, we're, we're gonna to touch on this in more than just humans, but first in humans, uh, when, we're, when we talk about energy cost, largely the predominant measure of this is through indirect calorimetry. And so this is essentially measuring the oxygen consumption and the carbon dioxide output um, of a user. And we can do these through these VO2 systems. Um, you can see one in our lab um, here where basically you measure the breathing rates um, and we can use the um, basic chemistry of converting that of your oxygen consumption to basically how many calories you burn. Uh, and that allows us to calculate how many watts somebody's burning. And to calculate cost of transport, we simply divide by the distance traveled. And so this is a, a very standardized rate that um, a lot of labs use to measure performance in humans, um, as well as humans augmented with exoskeletons or, or other powered devices, um, prosthetics, um, uh, and other interventions that you might use. And so this, is a, this has become a pretty standardized um, term. And what's exciting, if you kind of look over here on the right graph, this is uh, from a paper that Greg and I recently published. You can see what people have accomplished with exoskeleton technologies in, in uh, able-bodied humans. And, What's pretty cool is that, so what, what we're showing here is devices that have sort of done a first of some sort where a device has actually beaten uh, humans not augmented with anything. And that, that was a pretty big accomplishment in the field. Essentially, wearing a device gets you a larger benefit in terms of energy costs compared to not wearing the device. So humans are very efficient in their walking and usually adding mass has a big penalty. Um, but recently, exoskeletons have kind of broken this metabolic cost barrier and allowed humans to be more efficient than uh, if they're, they're not using any device. And that really occurred first in 2013 in the Malcolm study um, with an ankle exoskeleton. It was a tethered device, which means that it was not autonomous. There were, you know, the, the, um, the power sourcing of this was all external. But then a year later in the Mooney paper, an autonomous system beat the um, beat the beat the no exo condition significantly, um, which which was pretty exciting. And Elliot Rouse, who's one of the panelists, is one of the co-authors on that paper. And then in the very next year, 
Um, again, one of our panelists uh, in this, uh, this is a study with um, Steve Collins as the first author and Greg is the, Greg Sawicki is the senior author, managed to do this with a completely passive exoskeleton, so no, no actual um, motor. And so those are some of the big in, initial advances, uh, all with ankle devices. And then you can see as, as it goes on, some other first, like the hip managed to do it, and then the, the knee, and then even a combined device that um, out of Connor Walsh's lab that did both walking and running. And so as you can see, the field's really made big advancements, been able to beat the, the metabolic barrier. And you can see this also in, in, in this graph. This is kind of a graph of years versus metabolic change compared to not wearing an exoskeleton. So essentially devices are getting more and more efficient at beating the, the metabolic barrier over time. And what, what we've seen is that uh, early on, almost all of these were happening at the ankle. Many of these kind of shifted to, to other joints, especially the hip, and, and larger and larger metabolic reductions compared to you know, the, the unassisted human has been, have been made in exoskeleton technology. And if you look at some of the conference proceedings from this year, so this, this was through the end of 2019, uh, it looks like labs are set to beat some of these by potentially wide margins in the upcoming years. So it's pretty exciting. So the field is, is making a ton of progress in terms of, of this measure. And what I at least want to convince everyone of to begin this kind of talk is that um, this, is a, this is the gold standard measure. It is what is being used to compare devices across the field. Um, and lots, I think to select these ones, there were hundreds of studies that we went through in which metabolics were recorded. These are just the ones that beat the no exo condition significantly. Um, and so this is the growth standard measure. And we really want to debate today is, is continuing you know, progress on, on metabolic costs and beating um, sort of beating the, the no exo condition or, or improving in energetics, the number one goal of these wearable devices moving forward. On the same lines, we're, we're going to look also at this for mobile systems. Uh, this is a great graph produced by, by Songbase Lab um, at MIT. And what, what you see here is, is a comparison of some of the basic, this is a little bit dated, but some of the basic robotic walking systems, uh, either bipeds or quadrupeds, and how they compare to various uh, animals. And what you see on the x-axis is the log body mass. So as we increase mass, uh, that we typically can get a reduction in log minimum cost of transport. And generally, swimmers will kind of fall along this green line. Flyers are less efficient and fall along this green line in terms of uh, comparison to their mass. And runners, so uh, extraterrestrial runners uh, like humans, which is right here, um, fall on this, this higher line. And you can kind of see how some of the different robotics fit into this. Osimo and Big Dog very much less efficient. Bungbei's highlighting, of course, his, his cheetah robot being more efficient. But even in the, it, it basically in the autonomous biped world, this is a real key measurement that um, that was featured as one of the main competitions at the at the DARPA Robotics Challenge. Um, and and very interestingly, you can see some of you know man-made vehicles are, are sort of worse on this because of the the extra mass. But things like ice skater and bicyclists are are super efficient compared to compared to man, and that might be something we discuss a little bit later. But I think this kind of gives us an intro. You know, this is a dominant measure in the field, and what, what I kind of wanted to get across is that um, you know, looking at energy cost for autonomous systems, for human systems, has devote, uh, labs have devoted a huge amount of time, a huge amount of resources, and many things are measured off of this cost. And I think that there's significant concerns in the field that this is we're perhaps targeting this too much, but we can also debate that maybe this is still the correct measurement and we should continue to make lots more gains on energy costs. All right, with that, I'm going to start kind of the panel discussion. Um, and, and I will start with a question to each of our panelists. And um, Greg, I'm going to call you out as being the first one. As, as maybe the, I think, you know, probably the most knowledgeable about physiological costs of energy. So is energetic cost a good gold standard for the field of wearable and mobile robotics? 
So just go ahead and give, you know, what I want to see at, at the start here is just give your general positions and intro thoughts on the topic, just to kind of establish where everybody's at. Okay, yeah, thanks for the really good intro. Um, I mean, I'm a little bit biased, so I'm going to try to, you know, I'll give you my opinion and then I'll, I'll, I'll kind of list some pros and cons moving forward that I think that our lab thinks about when it comes to cost of transport. So I think uh, on the plus side, it's a very simple measurement, right? We know how to do it. It can be standardized across labs, like Aaron mentioned. Um, if you can measure oxygen consumption or some proxy for the input effort that the person's using to move in the world, then you can you can derive something like a cost of transport, which is technically defined as the energy needed to move a unit distance. Um, and you know, again, like it's 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 simplicity. I think is the simplest argument for it. Um, that it, it generalizes. It's easy to use. It's it's a standardized measurement that we can all kind of share. It shares a common currency. Um, it's also relatable in terms of our dissemination of our work to the general public, which I really like. So like when I give a talk, I always use the analogy of, of a car and gas mileage. That, that also makes it relatable to people who we're trying to turn on to our research or you know, um, make them understand things kind of in, in your elevator pitch or layman's terms about why our work's important. So for those reasons, I think it's, it's good. I'll also mention very quickly that you know, a lot of the work that we try to do with Wearable robotics has a clinical bent. We're interested in improving people's quality of life. And again, the, the simplicity of the measurement and the ability to track it sort of outside a laboratory setting makes it appealing. Um, so those are all the arguments for, right? Um, it's a tangible thing to work towards. Simplicity generalizes. Just to kind of paint a few cons that, that we think about, um, it doesn't consider time. So a, a clinical example is a good one here. If, if I'm a person who's a stroke survivor and I need to like get across the street before I get run over by traffic, um, having a, a, a low cost of transport might not be the best thing for me. I might need a high top speed. And cost of transport, by, uh, by definition, does not consider time. It actually eliminates time. And so if, if you take the extreme position to minimize cost of transport, you may end up with very massive things that uh, move slowly, but are, are, are economical of energy. And that, that's a lot of times not what the goal is for wearable robotics. So that's one thing is that it, does not, it doesn't formally consider time. Um, the other thing, the other big one, the elephant in the room is always like, uh, who really cares about it? Like if, if I'm, a, again, like is this a priority of a person when they move in the world? Are they thinking about the energy they consume? Or are they thinking about not falling over, for example? Or being able to manipulate objects while moving? You know, like what is the cognitive load of a task? Um, or, or So in general, our lab is shifting away from considering energy cost as the only factor that we care about when we design wearable robots and thinking more about sort of a, a um, a suite of things that people may be trading off in terms of their priority per task or per, per context. And those include things like stability and comfort is an especially important one. Uh, and also like measurements that have to do more with perception of effort rather than straight up measurements of effort, I think are, are becoming more and more important. So I'll leave it there. Hopefully that, that starts us off. All right, thanks, Greg. Um, let's go to, Someone on the mobile side. So, Ani, why don't you take the next round? Okay. Uh, so, the first thing I'll just say is to give some brief history of why we choose this metric. So, Greg did a good job, but I just want to hammer it. Cost of transport is actually measured by looking at how much energy you use to travel a certain amount of distance. And then in the denominator, you also have G, which is the gravitational constant and M, so the mass. So, it's trying to normalize by mass. So, you can think of it as a unitless metric. In some ways, it's sort of like the coefficient of friction moving. And you could ask why we're using this. Why don't we use the thermodynamic estimate of efficiency that, that you know you guys learned in heat transfer or whatever. And the reason for that is when you're a mobile system and you're moving on level ground, you're not actually producing any output work. Right? So to look at how much output work you produced, you're not going to get a meaningful result. So they had to invent this metric. They actually used it for natural locomotion first. Aaron gave credit to uh, Songbei's lab for that graph, but a lot of those 
he, a lot of those plots on that graph were actually from Vance Tucker at Duke, uh, who studied animals. And that's fine. Uh, and, and so I just want to give you history of the metric. I think that explains, it's a nice sort of engineering metric. It's unitless. These are all nice things. But I want to start with a little more controversial question. If you know, if you're in a fight, right, you care about your survival and, and you want to survive, right, which is what we should care about, what animals care about, who would you pick to be next to you? And I would say that cost of transport would tell you to pick like a marathon runner, right? Some guy who's like five foot four, really skinny, he's got calves that are enormous, and, and you would pick that guy. But I wouldn't pick that guy, I'd pick like LeBron James, right? And so if you care about survival, is cost of transport really the best metric? Because um, you're picking people that, or you're picking systems that may not be optimized for metrics that you actually care about in the real world. So Greg, I think, alluded to this, um, but a lot of cases for robots, right, especially uh, in, in, in diverse environments, cares about things like agility, surviving, not breaking, right, not getting hit by a car. And I, I think the cost of transport starts to weaken when we when we start using when we start thinking about those cases. So I just wanted to throw that out there. I'm not going to speak for too long about it. I have some obvious thoughts on this related to my own work, but um, maybe that's some some food for discussion for the rest of you guys. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Ani. All right, we'll go back to a wearables person. Elliot, why don't you take the next round? Remember, the question is, is energetic cost a good gold standard for the field of wearable and mobile robotics? Yeah, I would say like I kind of oppose it as a gold standard um, for a couple of reasons. The kind of the first reason is that like, I'm not sure a gold standard is appropriate. So like the, the main issue I have with metabolic rate in the field of wearable robotics is that it's really like a hyper focus on metabolism and cost of transport. It's really like one of the only metrics that we use to judge these systems. And that I find problematic. Exoskeletons assist with all aspects or many aspects of mobility. And this is sort of alluding to sort of what Greg said. I think what we need is sort of a, a diverse set of metrics on which to judge exoskeletons. And I think metabolism sort of rose as a gold standard, one, because it's measurable and we're engineers and we want to measure, quantify our systems, but two, also because it's accessible. It sort of makes sense that a system assisting you to sort of improve your efficiency. And so because of those two aspects, I feel like we kind of latched onto it. And in this talk, I kind of want to, or this kind of panel, what I want to do is like go over some evidence that says maybe it's not the best gold standard metric and then propose a potential new metric that's kind of out there um, as a topic of discussion. And I have a few like plots and kind of points I want to make, which maybe I'll make later in the discussion after we've done our initial thoughts. Great, thanks, Elliot. Okay, yay. Let's hear it from you. All right, uh, yeah, so uh, I think I'm gonna to comment a little bit more from the robotics side and the uh, I think definitely, I think as previous uh, panelists uh, said, I think definitely there are pros and cons uh, on like many different uh, perspectives. Um, and I, I'm going to talk a little bit of uh, some thoughts from uh, our groups and uh, um, maybe my uh, personal thoughts. So I think definitely this energy uh, efficiency is a, is, I mean, is a, is a well received metric for uh, autonomous like the system. Uh, although there are like many other metrics to uh, quantify the locomotion performance. Uh, so basically for, I think for uh, locomotion work, um, if you see like, if you see the, um, maybe not only the mechanical design, but also uh, the controller implementation, uh, even the high level uh, task and the motion planner design, uh, many times we solve an optimization problem. So in this case, if we want to generate some like optimal uh, motions for our uh, like the system or maybe your axle system. Uh, I think this control uh, effort or the activation effort, maybe always the first few terms are going to come to your mind when you design these cost of functions. Um, so I personally, I feel one direction I think pe people have been pushing a lot uh, these days is really uh, what is the best way to quantify uh, and benchmark the energy efficiency and in what kind of context? I think some uh, some panelists already mentioned this. Uh, I think one thing is basically the task uh, versatility. Um, so how this uh, energy efficiency can be evaluated, uh, maybe across different uh, locomotion tasks, uh, different uh, robot hardware. Uh, and I mean, definitely there's a trade-off uh, between the uh, 
task of versatility and the energy efficiency. Um, I just feel like many times, uh, if we see a lag of robots, it's maybe uh, designed optimally for one specific behavior, um, but it's maybe not necessarily uh, the best option for others. Uh, so in this case, um, I think how we can uh, design a good, uh, I think robust, uh, like the local motion system for a diverse of system is definitely very important. Um, I mean, and, and the definition of task diversity could be I think, very broad and uh, multi-level, like a local motion at different speed, uh, different patterns, uh, like quadruped, you have different walking gates. Um, and maybe different ways to interact with the environment. So I think there are a lot of things uh, we can comment. Um, but overall, I think the energy efficiency, optimizing it is important, um, but we should be clear about the context and the and their, uh, what the assumption uh, and angles uh, we talk about this energy term. Okay, great, thanks, Yay. So I, you know, I, I, I like the general intro. You know, I think one thing that, that I think about some as as a uh, as a reference is sort of from a neural control argument. Energy cost is something that, that all biological systems do optimize, which I think is is really interesting to to compare and to think about what biology sort of does. And this is something that get, that gets optimized, but I think most of the studies from the the literature will say that. It does so as sort of a last priority, right? Like a, a lot of other things. So, for example, if you kind of look at at kinematics, kinetics, EMG, and energy cost, the thing that is slowest to converge is your is basically your energy cost. And I think part of the reason is the body is optimizing other things, like you know probably probably something like stability, ensuring that you can do you know, a, a normalized walking gait and that you can achieve your goals is sort of more important than than metabolics. And so from sort of a philosophical perspective, it seems strange that the field would think that metabolics is the number one priority when biology doesn't think it's the number one priority. I think that's one of my, one of my thoughts is that really shouldn't we ensure that the gait is stable. I think if you look in clinical populations, a lot of patients would agree with this, which is they want to be able to go someplace and not fall down, not necessarily do it at the minimal energy expenditure. And so as device designers and control designers, uh, in, in many ways, I think that there's an argument that there's probably other variables that people care about and that biology cares a lot more about that we would want to optimize before we consider energy cost in the equation or in the human in the loop optimizer. So that that's one point that I want to bring forward. Um, you know, I, I do think on the sort of on the pros for it, one of the things that, is, that maybe wasn't mentioned is this measurement is super hard to cheat in terms of in terms of local sort of cheating, right? One good. I disagree with that. I disagree with that. <laughs> hey, this is supposed to be a debate. the task. It is very hard to cheat, as in you're saying that you're walking at a steady state speed, and this is actually one of the big dis disagree or dis disadvantages of it is essentially you can only measure it during a six minute walk test. So that's a huge disadvantage. But within that, within that test, it is very very hard to cheat locally, as in right you can make a bunch of different compensations and other measurements like EMG or joy torques or things like that, you know, can easily be sort of uh, whitewashed under it by, you know, but metabolics can't. Now, it, if you allow the task to heavily change, this metric becomes very easy to cheat. And I'll let Ani take it from there as to why he doesn't believe that it's a, a good measurement in terms of not being cheatable. Well, I think, yes. Thank you for that. Um, and I encourage you guys to interrupt and do so more belligerently yeah. going yeah, from now on, I, I think that opening statements are done, so feel free to. So, but I want to first address uh, this. This will help me address a question that uh, the panelists have upvoted. So I encourage, or the audience has upvoted, I encourage all of you to take a look at, at the audience uh, Q and A. Uh, so Sean Wilson asked a question. He says, "How do the panelists think of task and purpose to be incorporated into an energy cost metric for robotic systems or exit?" 
I think this relates to something that I wanted to talk about, and uh, that's endurance, right? So we keep on talking about energy efficiency, right? But let's talk about a metric that may actually matter to people, right? Greg talks about, you know, gas mileage, right? Mileage is endurance, right? It's how many miles you can get. Uh, maybe miles per gallon is an endurance, but miles that your vehicle can travel is probably more important than miles per gallon. And, and that's, that's just endurance. And so, for example, you brought up the 2015 DARPA Robotics Challenge, Aaron, and that had an endurance challenge. So they actually asked us, can you, how far can you go on a single battery charge? Because that's important, right? If you have a robot going out there to resupply people or whatever, right? You need to travel a long distance. The, the, uh, the sponsor or whatever isn't going to say, hey, your COT was, was 0 0.2, but you didn't get me our supplies, but that's okay. So, um, and so that leads to some interesting trade-offs. And, and one of those is how much fuel do you carry? How big is your battery? Because guess what? If you carry a big ass battery, which, you know, a lot of robots need those, your COT is going to go up. Some people may think it would go down because you're putting it in the denominator with mass, but it's not. It's going to go up because you have to bear all those loads. Your torques go up. Your, your, or, yeah, your loads go up. And I think that's a great illustration of even an energetic metric like endurance, right? Which we actually care about. Cost of transport, if you try and optimize your cost of transport, you choose a small battery, right? And you travel 10 feet, but you did it at an amazingly high energy efficiency, but you didn't achieve your mission, right? And so I think, so hopefully that answers Sean's question. So I think, I, I agree. I think we're trying to go with more tasks. I think Elliot has some good thoughts on this. So I'm going to hand it over to him. Uh, but I do think that, you know, even cost of transport can be gamed as well. I'll take the opportunity to, while Elliot's <laughs> muted, just to add on to the, the an example of cheating. So Aaron, you, you, you kind of mentioned that cost of transport is cheat free, right? And I think that an example okay. from wearable robotics is are these tethered systems where people offload the might of the motors and the mass of the structure, and um, and and they don't always report, they don't always acknowledge that when they're reporting the the, the, co the cost of transport performance of the user who's not carrying the whole device. So there there are ways to cheat this. I think one way to avoid cheating is to always compare against uh, you know normal walking and. And then also include a condition and be transparent um, of the device without providing, say, torque assistance or energy input, but just the, the load itself of the device should always be accounted for. So I just wanted to mention that. I think Elliot might be back online now. It looks like he, he's unmuted. Um, yeah, so, so like what I was hoping to do is I go through a couple of pieces of evidence that in my mind shows that it's not a good gold standard measure. So like there's two plots I want to show. Like I don't know if Aaron, you can share your screen. Um, the first piece of evidence that I want to discuss is that metabolic optimums are not consistent with what people prefer. So this is a study that we ran recently. It uses a variable stiffness ankle prosthesis, which is kind of shown here on the screen. Um, and the only thing that you really need to know is that it has kind of one definable and controllable parameter. That's the stiffness of the ankle joint that someone is wearing uh, for their prosthesis. So if you skip to the next slide, Aaron, um, if we look on this, I'm really going to talk about the plot to the right. So in this study, we measured people's preferred stiffness. We gave them a dial and let them select the stiffness that they find kind of best for them. And then we varied it by plus or minus 15% and plus or minus 30%. And we measured a host of different energetic and biomechanical factors that may change alongside changes of stiffness. So what we showed, if you look at the plot to the left, this is metabolic cost. Um, and the, the excess, excess there is stiffness or deviation from preferred. You see that there's really, the color here denotes uh, walking speed. You see that there's no relationship really between stiffness that people have a preference for and the resulting metabolism. So that's kind of like one point that I would say stiffness is, or um, metabolic rate is not consistent with what people appear to optimize. And then if you look all the way to the right on this plot, this is an example of what maybe people are optimizing, which is just to say kinematic symmetry is kind of a, the easy way to explain that plot. So we show that metabolic rate is affected by walking speed, but not by people what people prefer yet there are things that are affected by what people prefer. So that's kind of like one point I wanted to make. I don't know if anybody wants to respond to that, but 
the idea there is that metabolism is not consistent with what people prefer. If there's no response, maybe I'll talk about the other, the other uh, point. So the other piece of evidence I wanted to discuss, so this is work led by Leo Medrano in my research group. Um, what we're quantifying is people's ability to per perceive their own changes to their own metabolic rate. So in this study, we let people walk with an exoskeleton. We vary the control parameters for that exoskeleton and how much assistance it provides. And we impose metabolic uh, changes to them via this controller. And we let them walk for two minutes at one setting and then walk for two minutes at another setting. And then we ask them, did your metabolic rate go up or down? And we do this many times in a row. And what we can get is a, the concept of someone's just noticeable difference, which is the change in metabolic rate that they would perceive with 75% accuracy. And what we're showing, so I have one kind of one subject data that I can talk about specifically. We showed a J and D, a just noticeable difference of 25%. So that means unless you see a metabolic change by 25% or more, people won't really notice it. Um, this, to be fair, the standard deviation on that measurement was 23%, um, mostly due to the fact that we couldn't complete that study from COVID, the COVID shutdown. Um, we've continued to collect data from the, once we re-engage with research, and we're getting similar numbers between kind of 30 and 15% changes uh, are required for people to perceive it. Any response? Uh, no, I didn't have a response. I was just saying that was cool. <laughs> hey, Elliot, Thanks. actually, I, I, I'll play devil's advocate just yeah, for a little please. bit. I think um, on that last point, um, the just noticeable difference stuff, like I, I would say, who really cares if people notice? They might not know what's good for them. Yeah, that's a, that is a great, that's a great point. Um, here's my response to that. The reason why I think that this matters is because people's ability to perceive the changes that occur directly affects their decision-making practices. So if we want somebody to actually wear an exoskeleton, they have to have an internal sense of its value. And I would say like perception of metabolism, if that's the gold standard, should be part of that internal sense of value, which maybe, or maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So that's kind of like the key takeaway here, I think is that the reason why this matters because it, it's involved in acute decision-making. Do I want to wear this? Do I want to pay this much money for this system? Yeah, I really like placing it in the context of value like you have, um, where the, the, the user's perception then becomes front and center, like you say, like, is this thing valuable to me or am I just going to put it in the closet? For, yeah. for us folks on the call who design wearables, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, just notable, notable just noticeable perception for an autonomous robot is probably kind of completely irrelevant, right? Or is it? I mean, is there is there some analogy to the to the autonomous humanoid robot in terms of its ability to sense the the resolution over which a, a machine can sense its own state? That is important here too. What do you think about that? Or anyone on the panel? I guess I see Yay kind of nodding. A little bit like it seems like you know the ability of a of a robot to sense that does is, is an important design factor if we're going to keep it from falling over etc but whether the robot has a brain or cognition and knows how well it's sensing right is there an yeah. analogy to just notice noticeable dis, distant just noticeable difference in the autonomous robot world is what i'm getting at yeah, I think I can just, uh, I think, comment a little bit. And I think uh, sensing and the perception, I think, I mean, of the environment is definitely a very key uh, capability for, I mean, for both, I guess, variable and uh, autonomous, uh, like robots. Um, so, and I think this may be related to, um, I think, one metric, I uh, besides the energy cost, um, energy efficiency, um, maybe related to more uh, robustness. So this kind of, uh, when this like a, a very complicated uh, system deployed to the real world, uh, how we can uh, predict the unknowns in the environment uh, and also maybe responding to these unknowns um, and maybe reject the external disturbance. So I think these are all uh, important capabilities. Um, and I mean, this kind of like unknowns and the perturbations I think can either from this environment or maybe human itself, 
uh, or maybe the robot system uh, modeling itself. So uh, I think robustness is definitely an important uh, key metric uh, we should take into account. Uh, I mean, it's, it has been widely explored in, I think, many uh, robotics and uh, I think formal control method area, uh, even like human biomechanics, uh, people study how to uh, respond to external disturbance uh, robustly and keep balancing. Um, and even like in, I think, the machine learning, these days, machine learning and the AI planning, uh, a lot of people talk about the concept of like a safety, uh, correctness, uh, or even like verifiability. So, I mean, I think these are all related to, um, I guess what, what, to what level we can, uh, quantify the uncertainties and how to design, uh, robust controllers, um, all your planners to reject the disturbance, I think both internally and, uh, externally. So, uh, for like the system, I mean, basically like how to keep balance, avoid the falls and navigate in like a very complex environment and avoiding, uh, collisions with dynamic obstacles. Um, I think these are key questions we need to address. Um, I mean, this is maybe not very relevant, um, but I think just a personal thought I have is basically, um, we should reason about the robustness, not only from the low level control. I think there are a lot of work in this area, um, but also, uh, robustness from the high level, from the, uh, task level, from the decision making level. Uh, think about if there is a failure, uh, occurred at the low level. Um, for example, that like the robot steps on and maybe unexpected stone or soft terrain. Uh, how can we design a high level, uh, decision maker and send maybe a new command, uh, to the robots to achieve a robust, uh, disturbance rejection? Um, so overall, I feel like proposing a more like a coherent, uh, or maybe scalable, uh, planning control framework, uh, with robustness reasoned at, uh, um, multiple layers, uh, I think still, uh, still need a lot of more, uh, investigation. Um, I just feel the community, uh, doesn't have like a sound solution yet, uh, or at least a consensus. Uh, so I think many works are scattered to, uh, several different disciplines. So I think we definitely need a more, uh, unified solution on this robustness. Okay. So I want to, I want to ask. Aaron, can her. we get? Can we? Yeah. Can we actually get to a question? There's a pretty popular I, question. I know. That, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. Go for it. All right. So the most popular question that we want to, you know, and this was this was related to one of the questions I wanted to ask is, basically, can someone propose a second important variable that the panel agrees would be useful for the system to improve? And so, you know, sort of beyond energy costs, what you know, I don't know if we necessarily all going to come to agreement, and that's fine, but what what would people propose is what we should be using to benchmark progress what what would be a potential alternative golden standard that that people might be able to go to or what what you think it should be so let's let's hear from some people on that so i'm going to give a shout out oh ellie you're you unmuted do you want to go first sure yeah i can go uh i'm just gonna i want to talk through that last slide uh Aaron, if you could throw that up i got it um this is a like kind of new idea, a way to establish a kind of measurement of success for exoskeleton use. And it's going to be, it's really different than things that have been used in the past. So the idea is to obtain this plot that you see here, which is something like, you know, dollars per minute demanded. So, so like sort of cost, a, a monetary cost as a function of time where we test both kind of when people are unassisted and then people when people are wearing an exoskeleton and basically like what we're trying to show is as time goes on the cost to keep walking so like i guess let me take a step back every two minutes in this test you would be asked how much do we have to pay you to walk for another two minutes and you would be competing with some people virtually that that i won't get into for the sake of something called the vic reaction which is how this type of test is done so you would they would you would state an amount to keep walking for another two minutes and you'd be walking on a treadmill potentially up an incline so it's going to be difficult and then as time goes on you're going to want to do it less and less you'll get fatigued and you'll have to be paid more and more to keep walking so the idea is is to, to test this in both conditions exoskeleton assisted an exoskeleton unassisted and what we get is a like dollar value that is converted 
to how much the exoskeleton is worth to you during walking for two minutes. And it's kind of a it's a kind of a different way of looking at the problem. This is a type of method used in uh, fields of social science. And I think it kind of gets a more a potentially like accessible metric that converts to things that people really care about, like especially people who might be trying to commercialize this. How much is this technology worth to someone? Um, that's a really creative way of looking at it. And I think that's something that, you know, to highlight a little more broadly, I think is the real value of IRIM in these seminars is, you know, Elliot brought in something from social science, right? Next week, we're going to have someone from science fiction talking about stuff. Really bringing in different perspectives can, can change how we look at things. So that's really cool. Uh, my one criticism of that is a robot doesn't do that, right? A robot's not going to tell you I need $1,000 to do this or $2,000. So how would you do that to a robot? And I have some thoughts on, on a different metric. So if you don't have an answer, that's fine. I'm uh, just curious before I jump into that. Yeah, I would, I would say like, I can't think of a direct analog to the kind of mobile robotics world. The intent of that metric is to really like get at what people value and specifically the kind of monetary value associated with that. So that doesn't quite make as much sense in the context of kind of mobile robots or humanoid robots. So like I would kind of love to hear your response on that too. Yeah, so I'm going to shamelessly steal something that my wife suggested. Um, and she mentioned that in computing or uh, computer engineering, they do benchmarking where you have to run maybe a certain set of codes, maybe functions, maybe different tasks. And that's how you evaluate the performance of a computer. Uh, and so you have, you can define those tasks beforehand and you agree on them and then you evaluate performance based on the ability to complete those tasks. And so maybe in robotics, at least in mobile robotics, we need to come up with some canonical obstacle course, maybe something that really highlights why you would use a robot. So maybe it has to have some stairs, it has to have a, an incline, a decline, uh, a curve that you have to go over, a door that no robot seems to be able to open these days, um, things like that. And, and maybe all the mobile robots that are sort of being pitched for disaster response and cobots and all this stuff, they have to complete the same course and you look at, you know, how many times they complete it or how quickly they complete it. Or even in that case, maybe energy is okay. How much energy it took to complete the task. Um, I like time because I think time is, as you're sort of highlighting with your stuff too, time is valuable to people. Uh, and so, or success rate, right? In some cases, there may be a lot of failures. So, uh, but yeah, maybe I'll throw that out there as something, you know, that's going to be complicated, right? You're going to have to go take your thing to some course, maybe NIST handles it or something. Uh, certainly for the sim folks, I don't know how you do that with the sim folks because everything works in sim anyway. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I think that was a cool idea. I shamelessly stole it from my wife and colleague, but so give Ellen some dark credit for that idea if you like it. Also anonymous asking these hard questions. I know who you are and, and we'll talk. About <laughs> All right. So I'm, um, I'm going to propose mine by hopefully partially answering another question. So Locke asked, do people's conscious, uh, and we've kind of been talking about this a little bit, do people's conscious preference reflect what's actually good from them from a subconscious perspective? And, you know, I think we've been talking around some of this question, but some people, you know, I, I think that Elliot's, Elliot's measure is a very sort of, this is my conscious preference. And I do agree with Elliot. Our findings have been very similar in that People do not just prefer the lower metabolic cost conditions. I think that that's, that's been shown in C. Collins' work, that's been in our work. You know, there are some instances where, where they do, and it, I think it requires a giant energy change, really, to, to really, you know, that become the dominant factor as to why they choose it. And so I think that, but I do think that there's potentially, right, some, the, the issue of people, like, especially if you look at clinical populations, they're not always choosing what sort of maybe best for them from what we might think of, you know, scientifically or clinically, like from a physical therapist perspective. People may just choose what's best for them for completely sort of other reasons. And so that's why I'm going to propose kind of, you know, what I think should be the gold metric. But this is really, again, this is the problem. And this is why Greg kind of keeps going back of, oh, metabolic cost is so simple. And that's why we do it is because it is simple because this, this one is not simple but I think it is the gold standard, which is not what people think and not what we measure in the lab on energy costs, but what they actually do with the robot in the real world. And basically, I think the gold standard should be you take home this robot 
and do you actually use the robot and do you take more steps? And, and not just a quantity of steps, like a step monitor, but are you doing things that you weren't doing without the robot? I think that's like, are we improving people's quality of life? And to do that, you've got to be able to tell, you know, are they going out in the community where they weren't going out in the community before? Um, so basically being able to give somebody a robot, let them take it for a week and see whether, see how it affects their life is to me probably the gold standard that ideally the field would move for because that demonstrates in my mind sort of true value is that they don't just think it's better, but they're demonstrating it by wearing it and, and actually modifying their lifestyle. I think with autonomous robots, kind of the same thing. Like, does the robot sit in your closet or are people using it, right? Like, is that robot being used out in the real world or is it just a fancy toy in the lab that never gets used? I think to me, that is that is the gold standard measure. But again, I think we would all, all say that that's, it's really hard to do that, right? It's hard to deploy devices like that are robust enough that last for one week in a patient's hand. <laughs> that is not easy from a research perspective. but. To me, that's that's what should be the, the gold standard measurement is, is it changing actual daily lives in, in terms of their, their use of it and ambulation capabilities. Aaron, just want to add, I think this is a perfect topic for as a future of work program, <laughs> what they are looking for exactly, I guess. One thing like to just kind of build on what Aaron said, um, I agree, like with what you're saying, like what we really want to see is kind of impact in the real world. Like that is kind of the standard, the real standard by which we should judge these systems. But the problem with that approach is that, that those are the most difficult types of studies to run. And they require like robust hardware out in the field being operated by usually regular people instead of you know, trained engineers. Um, so like, I like that idea. It feels yeah. like there's got to be something between where we are well, now that, and where that. That's what Ani suggested, right? Is we come up with this standardized course that everybody can test on, right? That's like the in between the go out in the community and test and and just these basic energy measurements in the lab that we don't think necessarily translate well to real performance. Or at least I some think. Of Another idea for the bridge, because I, you know, I, I love the idea that we're thinking about our, our technology in terms of its utility and value, right? Like it, taking an economics kind of stance on this is, I think, the right, the right way to think about it. But, but like you say, there's a bridge. So if you log the number of hours, a couple, couple kind of um, devil's advocate ideas on the logging use. So, for example, I have like this big textbook in my house that I just keep the door propped open with. A measurement device might say I'm using that in a useful way, but it wasn't its intended use. So there is, there's a gap there in, in terms of figuring out how to log hours that are, uh, that are, that are actually, you know, leading to some goal of the technology in the first place. So that's number one. And number two, one way to, to put a bridge the, how do you make those, do, conduct those really hard in the home studies to what, what we now can do in the lab is to generalize the problem a little bit more and, and begin to study what are the attributes of a widget that make people want to interact with it. That is a, that's, that, you know, that, that could be a whole program at NSF trying to understand how people even measure value or, or, or codify value, um, how the, how the human brain manages that, uh, or an engineer who's thinking about their products. So I think there's a lot of sort of, um, engineering design, product development, cognitive, and sort of economic research that could help bridge these ideas about how we think about utility with respect to physical widgets, like we're talking about robots and wearable things. And one more thing, if we're going to do the course, we should run it like a decathlon so that people who are really good at one thing don't get totally forgotten. Um, so there should be like an overall prize and then, you know, maybe some sub prizes think Tour de France or decathlon style competition. Great. Okay. So let's, let's take another audience question. So one of the, I think one of the questions that got 
some votes was from Magnus. So do you guys think a one size all cost is appropriate in all situations? And that, you know, I, I want to start out there with something that I think is important that uh, let's touch a little bit on the clinical side of, of things on, on this one size all. In review panels, and I'm guessing Greg and Elliot have had similar experiences, there are many clinicians that have that struggle a lot with metabolic costs as a main outcome measure in that I guess that, that re, re, in some ways that rehabilitation is sort of not in many ways not the same thing and there's significant concern that if the field is minimizing or reducing metabolic costs that that's going to lead to atrophy and that patients may not be able to recover when they're using these devices because they're not going to use their muscles as much and that, that this is actually, you know, potentially these devices are bad, actually bad for patients because they're reducing metabolic costs. And so I, I would definitely like to have the panel comment a little bit about, you know, whether they feel like that is a valid concern that many clinicians have or, or whether that's, you know, or again, or whether that's not valid. Maybe. I can go first. Um, I think that's a like a really great point. I think that's a great question. Um, I don't think that is likely or maybe even plausible. Um, one reason for this is like I think if you assist people and they make their movements easier, they're not going to do less. They're going to do more. And that's like if you give someone a bicycle, you know, like they don't, you know, they go further. They go different places they haven't been. They do things they haven't been able to do. Um, and I think the same would be true for, for exoskeleton. So although like time will tell, like, it's difficult to know that without a broad study. But I think to me, that doesn't ring true with kind of what I know and have seen about people, mobility and technology. So metabolic cost optimization is good. <laughs> You're back to, back to the other side. <laughs> no, I, I, don't, no I, don't, I don't think that. <laughs> I think this is more about do we think that use of exoskeletons would actually have like detrimental effects to people's health along the lines of sort of what you were saying in that question? So, so I don't think that that's true. In my mind, that's separate from metabolic cost as a metric of success. Yeah, I can, I'll just sort of throw my full support on what Elliot says. Like we, we are starting to kind of examine this question in simulation because the large scale study is hard. Uh, but we do have we have a student uh, named Jordan Schrader who's going to lead sort of a exoskeleton gym study where we begin to address um, how long term use affects musculoskeletal tissues, etc. But but I I totally agree with Elliot when the, my answer to this question is always uh, to an audience. Well, we don't know. We need to do the research. But and and the bicycle analogy I think is 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 really a good one. So. And if you think about a bicycle that has a certain amount of air in its tires, as as a as an extension to that example, you know, if I if I um, drain the air out of your tires overnight and you don't know it, you're probably and I left it that way and you still didn't know it, you'd probably go do less things with your bike. On the other mm -hmm. hand, if I if I added a little e motor to your bike without you knowing it, you would probably change your behavior and do more things and access more more uh, access a higher quality of life. The other thing I want to mention is um, it's important to acknowledge that at least in wearables, there's two kinds of devices that I still think are, it's an important distinction. Like, are we talking about assistive technology or rehabilitation robots? Because rehabilitation robots were never really intended to be a crutch. The idea is to build a robot that helps someone regain their own strength independent of the robot. We're talking, so that whole class of robots, this, this question doesn't even apply to. And that's still a large portion of, I think, the robots that uh, uh, people who are working in clinical areas think about. The assistive technology robots, the ones that are meant to be worn as permanent assistive aids, those are the ones that we need to be thinking about this question on, for sure. So I think we're wrapping up. Um, if Aaron wants to continue a few more minutes, I did want to say something before I forget, because um, I think Ben, who may be one of your students, Aaron, just threw out a pretty sick burn. And this is what I want to encourage um, not only that exoskeletons are not like or should be examined like cars so he's dissing the cot thing 
He then dissed people who drive Priuses. And there is someone on this panel who drives a Prius. It's not me. So I'm not offended by it, but I'll let you respond to Ben. Ben's question is why, you know, why not specialize exoskeletons like car types? Not everyone likes Prius. Well, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not necessarily, you know, voting for MEVOT costs, but I think that, uh, I, I mean, I think I do like the idea that, that we would have metrics that we could put on a, you know, basically on a window that people that relate to people and gas mileage kind of relates to people, but I would, I would kind of argue that metabolic cost is not really all that relatable to the general public. I think we need a stronger, you know, a stronger metric that people can actually relate to as to how this enhances my life. Like, I think a good example with some of this robotic technology is, you know, I can gar I can guarantee that you can go do stairs where you could not do stairs before if you're some sort of walker, right? Like capability, I think is, in my opinion, more important than just energy cost. Like if we can if we can relate actual capability where you can achieve things that you can't achieve without the robot, that that to me I think is is an easier way of selling this technology where maybe people will actually put this device on before they leave their house and use it in the real world. Can I just like real quick, like follow up on that question? Um, the question kind of like relating the exoskeletons to cars. And I think that that, at least like in, in, in my field, like I think that might be like a little bit misleading of an of a analogy. Because like the goal of reduction of, of metabolic rate isn't to say like you can eat less. You know, like that's not, it's not about like converting food energy to mechanical work. It's about the ex, the intent of the exoskeleton is to provide mechanical assistance. And if you're, if it's providing mechanical assistance successfully, it should reduce the mechanical load on the body. And so it's kind of a measurement of, of that aspect of the exoskeleton, not, well, you know, you can consume less food energy if you use this. So I think like that analogy like emphasizes the wrong part of the use case in my mind. Awesome. Okay, we are we are at time, so I think it's it's time to wrap up. Is there any any panelists that have something burning that you either a question that you want to address or some last point that you want to make before we close the session? Anybody? Are you good? I just want to say thanks for doing this. This is such a cool format. The discussion has been great. The chat and like incorporating that has been fantastic. So I'm just really impressed by this whole thing. So I just want to say thank you for including me. We could not get to all the questions. There's a lot. Yeah, there were a lot of questions, but I think people were excited. But yeah, thank you, Elliot, for joining us. Uh, we appreciate that. And I think everyone should give a virtual applause for Aaron for actually organizing all this and executing it pretty well. This is the first time we've done it. All right. Thanks, panelists. That was great. Hopefully we have some follow-ups. Uh, one last thing to mention, if you are kind of interested in this, Alia and I are co-presenting a seminar on Friday this week for this new Frontiers here multi-university series. So that's Friday at 3.30. I think it'll go out in the IRM um, newsletter tomorrow. So, you know, if you're, if you're interested in topic, we will be Will be yeah. info for your seminar is also at the the IRM webpage right now robotics.gotech.edu. The info for your seminar is there. Oh, awesome! Thanks, Dr. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Anonymous. Also, um, just <laughs> for two weeks, uh, we got the Star Wars one. So tell all your friends. I think that one's going to be awesome. Uh, and uh, yeah, so see you guys in a couple weeks.